Okay, welcome back after lunch to everyone who was here this morning and welcome to all the new ones. And I see some ex-Betsonites, welcome to you as well. So, we had a very interesting morning talking about beauty bias and also neurodiversity. And now we're going to do something completely different. We're going to talk about gender pay gap analysis. So, hello everyone. My name is Lina Nordin. I'm the Chief HR Officer at Besson Group. And I'm really happy to see so many of you here today. There's a lot of different topics, agendas, workshops going on. So if you're here, it means that you think that this is an important topic. So that is good, because we believe that also at Betsan. So I'm going to talk about pay gap analysis. And why are we doing it? Because, of course, diversity inclusion is high on our agenda. And if you were here this morning, you heard about the DIB model, the diversity inclusion belonging model we have at Betsan. And one of the pillars is, of course, to treat people fair. And Maria talked about the beauty bias, and that is also something that we look into. How do we make sure that we treat everyone fair without any biases? I'm also going to start talking about the EU Pay Transparency Directive that is going to come in place 2026, and then how we at Betson search for a good model, a good approach to work with this. So, uh, before we go into there, we know that there's a big gender um, pay gap in EU today. Uh, can you close the door? Because there's a lot of background noise. And here you can see countries, for example, Luxembourg is the only country which is uh, on the positive side. And then you see the different countries. You can see, for example, Malta is a little bit in the middle. So this is the percentage of the pay gap. Um, and in EU, it's around 13% between men and women in general. But statistics is one thing, but we also need, need to look behind the statistics, the number. So if you look at this, you might say, oh my God, for example, Estonia, they have a very big gap, or Germany, for example, 17%. But then again, it might not be many women on the labor market in these countries. Or if you look at, for example, um, um, Romania, same there, there's a lot of women in certain areas and the gap might not be as representative uh, due to that. So we always have to look what's behind when we look at numbers, right? Um, but we also know that more women than men finish higher education in, in Europe, but they are represented less in the labor market. And according to numbers from last year, it's difficult to find uh, any statistics from this year, but almost a third of women, 28%, work part-time, compared to 7% uh, for men. And these, um, we also see that the pay gap is increasing with age. And that could, of course, be because women are taking breaks, staying home with children, uh, taking care of perhaps older people, their parents, etc. And also we could see that there's a big gap between different countries in itself. Uh, and also, of course, if we look at um, the, the pay gap in Europe, it's higher in the private industry than in the public sector in most countries. Um, for example, also, we know that if we compare to how many women are in management positions, uh, the average uh, in 21 was around 30, 35%. So we have a lot to, to do even in that area. But also this gender pay gap means that women are at higher risk of poverty at older age. And if we look at pension, uh, women uh, aged over 65 received pension that were on average 28% lower than men. And of course, as I said, women might stay home longer, they take a career break in the middle of their career to take care of children perhaps, or, or their parents. But anyway, we, we see that this is a big gap. And also the pension gap between men and women also differs between the different countries. Where, for example, um, in Malta, there's a 41.5% percent pension gap. So women don't have a lot of pensions in Malta, but in Estonia it's, it's quite equal between men and women. Um, there's also uh, a directive coming. Uh, we still have some time, but high-level summary, it will be implemented in June 26. So employees who have uh, more than 250 employees need to report annually on the gender pay gap. And companies also uh, need to share information about uh, how much the pay gap is between women and men. 
uh, for equal work, of course, and take action if the gap exceeds 5%. And there will be fines if uh, companies are not following this. This is in 26, but, but still, um, we at Besson, we have started to prepare for this. Um, we can skip this one. Um, and these new rules will make it then mandatory for employees to inform uh, candidates about the starting salary uh, range or the, the whole range, um, either when we make um, jobs, um, uh, when we publish them uh, externally or before interviews. So that is also something new coming. And we will not be allowed anymore to ask for pay history, what people are on or what they have earned previously. Um, and once we hire people, uh, they are also entitled to ask for average pay levels broken down by sex and also for the categories of employees doing the same work um, or equal, of equal value. So we have to have much more transparency when we hire people about the salary ranges. A little bit like in, in the UK and in the US, they show in the job ads what the salary ranges are. And then uh, once they are uh, hired, uh, they can also ask for uh, transparency around salary ranges, uh, etc. So that will, of course, change a little bit how we work, both when it comes to how we hire and how we work with salary ranges internal, of course. Um, yes, and also... Um, Something new is also, uh, yeah, the reporting, as I said, 250 employees need to report that on an annual basis if the gender pay gap is higher than 5%. For small organization, up to 150 people, it's gonna, they have to report every third year, uh, as it looks like now. And if the gap is 5% or more, the company also need to uh, do a joint pay assessment with uh, representatives from the company. In some countries, that may, might be the unions that have that task, but uh, if you don't have any unions in, in Malta or in the countries where you have uh, operations, uh, the employees will form some kind of um, yeah, uh, committee, uh, and you need to discuss and, and show uh, why th there's a gap. Um, so they, there will be more transparency around that as well. Uh, and also, for, for the first time, intersectional discrimination, that is a combination of multiple forms um, or disadvantage. It could be, for example, gender and, and sexuality. Uh, that needs to be included in the scope. And also, when it comes to disabilities, that needs to be reported. So I think this will be a big change for, for companies. Uh, but again, it's going to take place in 2026, so we still have time to pre uh, prepare for it. Uh, at Betson, um, we, we said we started last year and, and uh, we said let's at least uh, make sure that we have a good um, assessment for this. Uh, we have done it uh, many years, but we haven't really done it in a structured, transparent way. So we were looking for a tool, a way, uh, a process. To, to look at this, and it's not enough just to look at average salary uh, across the organization, because the gender distribution, as I said, could look very different. You could have more women in certain areas like HR, or you could have less women uh, on, on top management positions. So just doing an analysis where you look at the average salary between men and women is not uh, sufficient. Uh, okay, so what we did, perhaps we need better batteries in this one. It's very slow. So we did an initial analysis. So we compared uh, average salaries by gender. So of course a lot of benefits because in some countries where we have operations, we need to report annually on, on pay gap. So that is today sufficient in many countries just yes, to look at the average salaries between men and women. But of course, the, does, this doesn't give us any conclusion. Uh, it doesn't help us to drive this internally or, or be at the forefront. So we moved on. So we did a regression uh, analysis to determine the factors that yes, have an uh, impact on the pay decisions. 
Uh, I will show you on the next slide uh, uh, what this is. So we looked at job level, job family, age, uh, high performer, key employee, and gender. And then we cross-checked all these factors uh, between men and women for the same types of roles, of course. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. But we have 2,200 employees. We have 200 contractors. So for us, we have enough data to be able to do this cross-checking uh, between these different areas. Uh, we used a tool called R. It's a free to download if you're interested to do the same, but you will need some coding skills. Uh, we got some support from our data team to put this in, in, in practice. And then we did different kind of analysis to check if the result was relevant and, and, and correct. So uh, if you're interested to look at this tool, um, we'll make sure to send this out to you afterwards as well. Uh, the result from the analysis, we saw that job leveling, so we work with Mercer, so all our positions are evaluated. Uh, we have one position in class, uh, and then we have family uh, groups uh, and leveling, etc. So I don't know if you work with any of these uh, tools, but it's really, really good because it gives you a very good structure when it comes to evaluating positions. And then each position is connected to a salary range, start, mid and, and high. Um, so there were no strong correlation between men and women when it comes to the job leveling. Um, Sorry, there was a strong correlation because higher up in the, in the organization, your job um, leveling, your position class becomes higher in numbers. So then it means you're more experienced. So that had a strong correlation. Same with age, there was also strong correlation. Um, key employee as well. Um, but not for high performers. And I want to explain that in, in Betson, when we talk about high performer, it's someone that is ready for promotion the coming year. So when the person is uh, yeah, being promoted, the person moves down again uh, and is no longer uh, a high performer because that person starts uh, kind of uh, from scratch in the new positions. So there were no uh, strong um, correlation there. Um, job families was also, it was very tricky to assess, but we didn't find any um, correlation when it comes to gender, so that was good. So that, you know, ensured us that we have a really good structure when it comes to, to gender pay um, differences. So men and women were paid the same for the same types of, of, of roles. But this analysis didn't give us information about individuals. It was more on general, if we looked at the, the, the job families. So then we decided to do, uh, now we're doing a salary modeling. So uh, with the help of our data team, we set up uh, a model that we haven't really seen the result of yet. But with this model, uh, we will be able to establish if there are any individual salary gaps. So not just comparing job families or, or position in class uh, uh, with each other. So it will be more uh, on an individual level. This requires a lot of work. It's not easy uh, to do um, if uh, you are uh, you know, more than, I would say, uh, if you are less than 500 people, you, you might be able to do it quite well in Excel or with other tools. But when you approach 2,000 people, also spread out globally in different countries, different cost of living, different benefits, then it becomes quite complex because we also add benefits into this model to see, so for example, women are not having less bonus uh, levels than men or less benefits. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a, a big project that we are uh, you know, working with right now. But we felt that we wanted to have this in place this year so we can use it for each year when we go into the uh, annual salary reviews to make sure that we do um, an analysis before we go into the ASR but also after to see so managers are not... Um, using some types of biases when they do the, the salary reviews. So it's very neutral, gender neutral, and very objective. So uh, I think if you join us in October, when we have the big bets on uh, diversity and inclusion conference, then we will be able to tell a little bit more. Um, and, and we will also you know, show you a little bit the result, because I think there, there are gaps out there. We just need to identify them and, and, and make sure that um, we address them properly. 
So this is just a summary. I took this from internet, so it's not the best picture because I couldn't find our areas. But sometimes you say, oh yeah, this, this guy, he, he earns $60,000 uh, and this woman, 54000 So there's a gender uh, pay gap here. But what you always have to do and that is what we're trying to do, is to go a little bit deeper, to look at the job role. Is it the same? Um, uh, do they have different types of education? Um, do they have different types of work experience? We used age instead of work experience, because it's diff we have both age and how many years they have been in the position within Betson, but also previously. And so you have to look into it, because otherwise it, it's easy to say, yes, we have a, we have a gap. But it could be that, in this case, that the guy has much longer um, education, uh, higher education. He might have, you know, longer experience. He might have been in a managed position before. So you always have to look at what's beneath the surface uh, to get to, to, the, um, to the, the gap in itself. So before we go into to the panel, um, do we have any, any questions? Yes. Sorry, it may seem quite naive. I do apologize. The previous slide where you showed the picture of Roman stand up is easier. Is my voice loud enough? Can you I don't know if, if the others can, can hear. Because I have quite a big mouth. But yeah. <laughs> if you want the mic. The one on the. On the or not the no, the, the next slide where the people were. Oh, goodness. Here. I, I really don't need this. I'm really loud. Okay. Oh, you, you do. Yes. <laughs> so, um, with the analysis of the uh, difference in the percentages explained, what, I'm sorry, it's not, like I said, it might sound like a stupid question, but what determines what little percentages are, uh, what information is input, or how do you break down the percentages for each, each different um, experience that, that each candidate might have. Does that make sense? Yes. So we have a formula for that. So we've done some research and, and looked at what, what other companies are, are doing. Um, so, so there's a formula that the data team helped us to, to put in place. So, um, and we try to be quite neutral because, of course, is, is higher education, is it more that does that bring more value than, for example, um, uh, the job role or management uh, responsibilities? So there are actually, especially in US, a lot of companies that have models for this. So they have this breakdown how they weight each area uh, with each other. So we, we use what, what is most common out there that we could find. I don't have exactly, this is, as I said, this is, this is not our percentage. This is just a picture that I took from, from internet. Just one other question, sorry, because I was, as you were presenting, I was thinking of different things. So um, I am from South Africa, but I've lived in Ireland for a very long time, and it's, for, it's not unusual to see a scale, especially with government jobs and civil servant jobs. How do you think that that will impact on the uh, market in Malta specifically, where you have seen adverts that only require Asian people, Filip whether Filipinos, Indians, uh, yeah, they're very. Um, the Middle East is very much the same. So for me, it's very discriminatory. But I'm not actually affected by it as a, a Caucasian woman. How do you anticipate that that would affect the market when it does come into Malta, and also with the fines and the enforcement of it? Do you think that it's something that will be enforced, given that in this country not a lot is? Sorry, it's quite a little bit controversial, but I just wanted to ask you because we're all based here. So how do you think it will impact the market here in Malta, basically? I think that you could always. Uh, work around statistics. It's what you report, right? And who is doing the reporting uh, in the company? And how do you look at the different factors? Uh, so I think it will take time before it's really implemented. Um, because I think most companies will come to the conclusion that they have less than 5% uh, salary gap. Uh, and then there's no need to discuss with the, the employee committee or, but they need still to report it into each country in Europe will have some kind of authority looking into this. So you still need to, to, to report in. And then of course, uh, as we go along, there might be more you know, checkups and, and, and uh, it could also be employees who could report the company into these authorities in each country. Um, etc. Uh, so, but I think it will take time, as you said, um, especially in, in a country like Malta. But it will, I mean, we, we know that as, at least we have to advert the salary ranges, that's one uh, start. Is it good or bad? I think people have different opinions about that. Will it help women when the salary ranges are transparent? 
Uh, I heard one discussion actually when we were in London where people said, yeah, but what if you... What if you see the salary range and you apply for, let's say you get a promotion uh, and, and you see the salary range. Um, you have to, you know, have the courage to go to your manager and say, you know what, why am I not at the top of the range? Um, so the managers, of course, might say, no, no, because you don't have the experience and you are actually a very good place here in the middle. But then you have to argue, you have to negotiate. And we will talk a little bit about that later on also. How can we step up as, as women as well to have the courage to actually ask and require and demand as well. So it's going to, I think this is going to cause both positive things because you will see what the range is, but that will also mean that if you don't end up at the higher end of the range, how do you feel? How do you, how do you go along that? And companies then, of course, need to be able to explain why are you at the lower end because it also has to do with performance. You know that if you are a high performer, you might end up at, at the higher end of the, of the range, because performance is, for example, in bets on one of the criteria. When we have the ASR uh, each year, we look at salary range. So let's say that you are a high performer, super good, but you're low on the range. So we have a formula. Uh, so the manager will get a recommendation in salary already now. Um, and he will see that you're low on the range, but you're a high performer. That means that you should have a little bit of a higher increase compared to someone who is high on range, but perhaps is, is a low performer. So that we already have in place as recommendations to our managers when we do the uh, annual salary reviews. But now after 2026, you know, of course, the employees will ask for full transparency for the positions. So then we just have to make sure that we work with this even more in a structured way so we could also convey and, and explain why people are on certain levels.